Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here with another picture book biography for Women's History Month. Today we're going to read about Margaret Chase Smith, who was a Mainer. Let's find out more about her in this book, A Woman for President, by Lynn Plord, also a Maine author, illustrated by David McPhail. This book is published by Charles Bridge Press. She couldn't become president of the United States. She was a she. Only a man could be elected president, right? Maybe not. In 1964, Senator Margaret Chase Smith made an announcement. She began her speech by explaining why she should not run for president. She didn't have enough money. Most thought that there was no chance she would win. Plus, some people said a woman wouldn't have the energy for a national campaign. She concluded, because of these very impelling reasons against my running, I have decided that I shall. What a president she would have been, a surprising one. When Margaret Chase Smith was born in 1897 in the small Maine town of Skowhegan, women in most of the United States could not even vote, not for dog catcher, not for governor, and certainly not for president. It wasn't until 1920 that women throughout the country could legally cast their ballots. Margaret came from a poor family. Her father was a barber who drank too much and suffered from severe headaches. Her mother frequently worked outside the home waiting tables and stitching shoes to help support the family. They lived in Margaret's grandfather's house because they could not afford their own home. What a daughter she was, one who came from humble roots. Margaret faced challenges and tragedies early on. When her baby brother Roland suffered from convulsions, she helped to carry from him. He died of pneumonia at the age of one. Three years later, Margaret's two-year-old brother, Lawrence, also died from dysentery, an infection of the digestive system. The family could not afford to have a gravestone carved for the brothers, but Margaret's mother ordered one anyway. Then she did laundry and ironing for the stone cutter's family in order to pay for it. Margaret did her share, too. Even on cold, snowy mornings, every day before school, she walked a mile to the stone cutter's house to deliver a quart of fresh milk from her family's cow. What a sister she was, compassionate and responsible. From the time that she first learned to speak, Margaret called her grandfather banker, perhaps because it was easier for her to pronounce than grandfather. Whatever the reason, the nickname was most appropriate. Even the banker worked at a factory, not a bank. He was the most frugal person that Margaret knew. As a senior in high school, Margaret wanted to leave Maine for the first time to go on a class trip to Washington, D.C., her parents couldn't afford to send her, but one day, Banker brought Margaret to the bank and withdrew $60 to pay for the trip. Then he made Margaret sign a note promising to pay him back every part of that $60, the $60 plus 6% 6 interest. What a granddaughter she was, one who learned the value of money. When Margaret graduated from high school, she could not afford to go to college. She tried different jobs, working in a one-room schoolhouse, in a telephone company office, and for a newspaper. Margaret also became involved in women's organizations, including the Daughters of the American Revolution, Business and Professional Women, and Sorosis, one of the first women's professional clubs in the nation. She soon became a leader in these organizations. Margaret considered the experiences her college education. What a student she was, one who learned much from the real world. After graduation, Margaret began dating town selectman and state legislator Clyde Smith, who was 21 years older than she was. Even though Margaret and Clyde were both adults, her parents still chaperoned their dates. In 1930, after more than a decade of courtship, the couple married. Margaret wasn't a traditional wife who knew about cooking and housework, although she did learn how to make a New England meal of baked beans and brown bread to serve Clyde's political guests. Once, when Margaret tried to impress Clyde by making fish chowder, he suggested she spend her time to better advantage. So she did, helping her husband with his political duties. She kept track of his appointments, took notes at meetings he attended, and drove him all over the state to campaign. What a wife she was, one who was valued as a political partner. In 1936, Clyde was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. Margaret loved living in Washington. She called on the First Lady at the White House, joined an organization for Congresswomen's wives, and took public speaking lessons. Margaret seemed to be getting ready for bigger and better things. 
Before things got better, they got worse. Clyde died suddenly, and Margaret became a widow. She was only 42 years old. She had little time to mourn. It had been Clyde's deathbed wish that Margaret take his place in Congress. One month after Clyde died, Margaret won a special election to finish out his term. It was the first election of many during her eight years in the House of Representatives and her 24 years in the Senate. What a congresswoman she was, ready to serve at a moment's notice. Margaret, as a woman in a man's world and a high school graduate among college graduates, was determined to prove that she belonged in Congress. She did so with hard work and by paying attention to details. She personally answered thousands of letters, carefully researched issues before congressional hearings, and wrote a newspaper column giving voters an inside view of Congress. Margaret was sent to the House and later the Senate to vote on the nation's business, and vote she did. For 13 years, Margaret did not miss a single congressional roll call vote. She voted a record-breaking 2,941 consecutive times. What a senator she was, dedicated and hardworking. Margaret was a strong military supporter. She worked to make certain that United, the United States would be ready for any crisis or attack. As Margaret began her Senate career, she chose Major General Bill Lewis as her administrative assistant. He worked by her side as her personal and political best friend for more than 30 years. Margaret helped women in the military receive the same status and benefit as men with her landmark legislation, the Women's Armed Services Integration Act. Previously, men, women were considered volunteers in the military and received no benefits. As a woman in Congress, Margaret was not expected to be a leader on military issues, but many were learning to expect the unexpected from Margaret. What a fighter she was, one determined to defend her country. Margaret was also passionate about flight and space exploration. As a reporter in 1925, she took her first ride in a biplane. Years later, wearing an orange jumpsuit and high heels, Senator Smith rode in an F-100F Super Sabre as it broke the sound barrier. As a member of the Aeronautical and Space Sciences Committee, Margaret supported space exploration, prompting the head of NASA to say, if it were not for a woman, Margaret Chase Smith, we never would have placed a man on the moon. What an adventurer she was, one who reached for the stars. In the late 1940s, something called the Red Scare was sweeping across the United States. Red symbolized communism, a political and economic system that many Americans believed was a threat to freedom. Senator Joseph McCarthy began unjustly accusing many Americans of being communists. Innocent people were losing their friends and their jobs because of gossip, not because of facts. No one dared to speak up against Senator McCarthy for fear of seeming unpatriotic. No one, that is, except for Margaret. In 1950, she gave her now famous Declaration of Conscience speech. The right to criticize, the right to hold unpopular beliefs, the right to protest, the right of independent thought, the exercise of these rights should not cost one single American citizen his reputation or his right to a livelihood. Otherwise, none of us could call our souls our own. What a leader she was, one who dared to speak the truth. It was said that if a man had delivered the Declaration of Conscious Speech, it would have been the next, he would have been the next president. Margaret was not a man, however, and no one was rushing to put her in the White House. Many fellow Republicans still supported Senator McCarthy and treated Margaret as an outcast. Margaret decided to let the people, not politicians, decide if she should be president. While campaigning in 1964, Margaret listed her qualifications. Years of experience, independence, and the determination to take the best from Republican and Democratic ideas and put them together for the good of the nation as a whole. Margaret wanted to be known as a candidate, not a woman but it was hard to escape being defined by her gender. As one of her supporters said, the other candidates were only running for president. Margaret Chase Smith was making history. What a candidate she was, a truly historic one. After losing the presidential nomination, Margaret served in Congress for eight more years until she finally lost her senatorial race in 1972. She lost not because she was a woman, but because some thought that she was too old. She then served as a guest professor at colleges and started the Margaret Chase Smith Library. She had schools and bridges named after her, received 95 honorary college degrees, and became one of the first 20 women inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. 
In 1989, President George Herbert Walker Bush presented Margaret with a Presidential Medal of Freedom. Margaret Chase Smith died at the age of 97 on Memorial Day in 1995. She died at home in her own bed with her purse nearby. Her purse, which on that day, as on every other day, contained a copy of the Constitution. What an American she was, patriotic till the end. What a president we would have had, president we would have had, and Margaret Chase Smith. Here's some more information about her and a picture of her. More information and the sources that were used, as well as some other places that you can visit. I hope you enjoyed learning about Maine Senator Margaret Chase Smith, and I hope you'll join us for more picture book biographies for Women's History Month. My name is Sarah Murray Cropley. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you again soon. Bye.